Hi. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Go books, everybody. Yeah. Books. Books are fucking awesome. <laughs> Exciting. Thank By the way, I have undergone a full personality change after wearing this Steve Jobs mic. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a cocky motherfucking talk, you guys. <laughs> there was so much motivation going on in the green room, you guys. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. <laughs> it is true. But you too can be your best selves. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we do here in the Bay Area is to make you feel like you're living in an episode of Silicon Valley. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Right. Um, so I'm just going to start off with the most basic question, which is you guys are very busy and you're very prolific in the film and TV world. So it wasn't like you were sitting around with a lot of spare time thinking how to fill it. <laughs> Uh, why did you want to write this book? I mean, I think the first thing that occurred to us is, you know, making films and television has been pretty good to us financially, but we really wanted to make a big score in the book world, because that's, <laughs> that's where the cash that's... comes flowing in. <laughs> it's really the future, guys. It is. <laughs> it's um, cutting down trees and writing words on yeah. it. <laughs> We are cutting edge in this regard. Right. I mean, it's totally um, obvious. <laughs> the 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 not the not so interesting answer is that we were actually approached by um, this lovely woman, Pamela Cannon, who uh, was our editor, and she said, "I think you guys are ready to write a book." And we said, "We don't think we are. Um, we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> and we're in our sort of you know uh, mid 40s, and there's a lot of life left." Um, and, um, and she said, you know, no, look, I think that, you know, you have some things to say, so think about it. And, and Jay and I had our little internal conversation, you're going to learn a lot about these when you read the book, um, where we asked ourselves that, that seminal question we asked before we make anything, which is like, okay, all of you have, you know, 500 movies and TV shows on your Netflix queue and another 50 to 100 books you want to read. If we're going to make something, it should at least offer something, so it's just a, not another thing that you feel guilty about not getting to. Um, and, um, and then when we started talking about that, we kind of both started talking about how, for better or for worse, Jay and I, um, we get hit up a lot by up-and-coming artists of all disciplines who say, like, we would, could I take you to coffee and just, like, pick your brain, which is their nice way of saying, like, you're a genetic B minus and you made it. If you can do it, <laughs> I sure as hell can figure this out. Um, and it's a nice compliment. It is. It's really a is. nice. It, feel, it feels good. It feels good. Um, and the truth is, they're right. We agree. Um, and and but you know, as you said, we're kind of workaholics, and we you know we're husbands and dads, and so we don't have a lot of time for that. And so we thought this would be a good place to kind of step that out. And then I think the the second thing, which was more of a discovery of the book, was like, um, I guess, the, a study on our, our collaborative process and, and the feeling of like um, how close we got growing up in the middle of nowhere with no connections to the industry and kind of linking arms and saying, oh, if we're going to do this, we should like basically link everything, arms, soul, spirits, the whole thing. And we didn't think that was weird um, until people started perceiving our energy in the, in the industry. And, and they, would, they were always saying things just like, like, North American dudes don't speak to each other the way that you guys talk to each other. There's like so much validation and so much hugging and so many tears. <laughs> and, 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 um, and so we thought, okay, well, that's, that maybe is something too. So is that second part something you knew would be a part of the book or was it something you wanted to work through while you were writing the book? It was something that uh, I don't think we thought it would be a big part of the book. I thought it would, we just thought it would be baked in the way that it normally is because we would make movies and TV shows and people would be like, wow, the, the, the male relationship was 
very unusual. A lot of I love yous and stuff. And we were just like, yeah, like just male friendship, right? <laughs> and they were like, no, that's, there's way more punching involved uh, normally. <laughs> People started to use the words like, we found it very odd. <laughs> and then we realized, we're like, oh yes, male intimacy often as presented in somewhat mainstream art, it takes the form of things like I love you, man, where it's like either a farce or like the inherent comedic device is like slight homophobia, basically, you know? Um, so yeah, that kind of occurred to us. It was like, as we started digging in, that it, that it grew. And, and then I think in particular for us, um, you know, something kind of pivotal happened when we were making Togetherness, um, and it was, it was sort of the height of our, like, working together, writing, directing, producing every single episode, together on set 14 hours a day. Um, and when Togetherness got canceled, that opened up a little bit of space in our relationship, and that was while we were writing the book, and that was, I guess, part of the surprise of this book was us I think we thought initially this was going to be more of a treatise or a manifesto on the greatness of what our bond was and our union was, and it was. I mean, it was, I have no qualms in saying, like, like probably the greatest years of my life were us in our creative discovery mode in our teens and our 20s. Um, but it then turned into kind of an examination of some of the downsides of that and how that kind of swallowed us up. And, and we had a distinct lack of being able to individuate in that partnership. The book's also, um, I won't say unusual, but it, 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 in its, it's construction. Odd. <laughs> it's it odd. It's odd. <laughs> kind of weird, kind of, <laughs> this is different. You know, well, you'll different. see when you read it, it because it, it has a lot of different things and themes that run through it. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about just sort of how you worked out what the book was going to be constructed of. Yeah, I mean, I think the process was a lot like how we came up making movies, how we continue to do stuff, which is very, like, cavemanish and insular and just grunting and trying things and failing and pushing each other off of cliffs and being like, you okay? All right, come back up. You know, <laughs> just that, that scene in Zoolander when they're trying to get the files out of the computer. <laughs> that? I mean, that's basically yeah. how we work. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of unusual things about the book. There's like uh, the voicing in the book, we use the royal we a lot, which was also like uh, one of our title ideas for the book. It was way too regal for us because we're just basically puttering around in our underwear most of the time, but <laughs> the royal we didn't seem to fit. But, you know, w but we also write chapters individually and, um, you know, it's partially a memoir, partially just like a how-to in terms of how we came up in the business. And then, like we were saying before, I think the biggest surprise was this sort of like avalanche of discovery on our part because, you know, like, because we are so insular and because we have locked arms and because we've made movies in this very immigrant style, sort of just like put your head down and just keep making stuff and divulge yourself, we didn't have, you know, in interviews we would learn how to articulate how we came up and what our process was, but we had never done that in regards to our relationship and what we had been through. And I think this book was a, uh, a that was brand new for us in terms of like, wow, what did we do? How, that was unusual. What the shit that we went through, and when there's two of you, it, it weirdly allows you to go through more stuff because you're, you're there to support tougher. each other, but yeah. you, you kind of look at the other one, and you're like, he's not having a panic, att panic attack and diarrhea. He was secretly, but like, <laughs> I didn't know. You know, and, and you just kind of like push through, and you know, it, we were able to kind of like, understand because you know like mark said with togetherness we really reached a point where i would say like 99 percent of our brotherhood was being put into making that show togetherness uh, it it required all of it and at the end of the day of a 14 hour day you don't want to hang out and go get a beer with your brother you speed home so that you can be a decent dad and a decent husband for that moment and so th it was a big uncovering of like what we have been through, um, and also like realizing that we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to 
put our heads down and ram it into a wall until it opens up and then we're like, okay, what's next? You know, I, I think that's been a big part of our journey and this book being a sidestep in a way too is, is like when you do link arms and you approach things you know, the way that like our grandfather and his brothers and their sons made a dry cleaning business in the late 30s um, and you're just surviving, like it's, very, it's hard to turn that off, that compulsion to make stuff, the compulsion to just like beat each other up and beat a project up within each other. So that's kind of where we are right now and it's brand new. That's exciting and scary, I'm sure, yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talk in the book about how your filmmaking was informed by films that you had watched and like movies you watched on TV. I'm wondering when you were like, okay, now we're going to write a book, was did you read a lot of other sort of... No, books by no, filmmakers or like artist memoirs. No, we or... made that mistake in our in our early days as filmmakers of like uh, essentially being derivative and trying to find influences to help us make our stuff. And um, you know, we came from the suburbs of New Orleans, and there were no links to the film industry whatsoever, right? And so when we were coming up, um, this idea that we might go make movies it seemed so far away that I think that's part of why we kind of linked up the way that we did. Um, but then what happened is, is we started thinking, well, if we're gonna make a movie, we should make the movie like the one that we really like, you know? Um, and I think that's a common mistake that a lot of young artists make, is you make the things that you are a fan of, but you don't actually make the things that you are uniquely qualified to make. Um, and it took us, a little longer than the average person, about 12 years of failing um, <laughs> before we realized what we were even close to, to good at. So when it came time for writing the book, I mean, that's one thing good is that we had a, a massive learning curve and that we didn't know how to write a book. But as artists, we were a little bit ahead of the curve and knowing that the more we try to think about things and wrap our heads around it and, and say, should this be in first person singular, should it be? And we, we, when we put that stuff aside and we just go right into our stomach and just start grunting around and putting things on the page, that is how we personally excel as artists. You know? and, and we very much realize that like, there are people out there like the Coen brothers who can use their magical A-plus brains <laughs> um, and, and see a whole movie and go ahead and execute that thing. But when we try to do that, which was really ages, you know, 18 up until we were in our late 20s, we really failed miserably as artists, and it was, a, it was tough. So, as you mentioned, the, the book is, uses we. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's clear which one of you is writing. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Were there things that you were actually writing at together at the same time and how did that mm -hmm. work or did you all always just break out and then we was it is we it similar the to same your room. we haven't written the same room on anything that's ever been successful yeah <laughs> ever it doesn't really we we orally tell each other stories a lot and mm -hmm. um we learned a lot in the development process of like you know, when, you, when a story is coming together, you like try it out on people, and then when you watch their eyes start to droop, you're like, oh, that's not working too well, or you start to feel yourself talking really fast because you don't know what happens next, and you're getting nervous, <laughs> and you start fumbling, and that tells you a lot. So we do a lot of that together, but the writing in this book was, was very separate in a good way. You know, mm -hmm. we would just say, hey, let's try this chapter out, and, and we rewrote each other's stuff a lot, and I remember at some point, like Jay telling me after I had done a rewrite on one of his chapters, he was like, you like voice that in my voice better than I voice that in my own <laughs> voice. And that's part of the benefit of having spent 40 years in lockstep with each other is we're able to do things like that for each other. Oh, cool, so we shouldn't always assume we know who's writing. You can assume, but you know what that does? So. That makes it <laughs> you me, man. I mean, it sounds... My daughters love that one, by the way. <laughs> you break that down for like a 10-year-old, oh, dude. 
<laughs> the process you're describing of writing the book sounds similar to the process that you describe when you're working on writing together yeah, for yeah. film and TV. Were there any major differences or was it basically the same process that you use? It's very much the same process. I mean, I think, and this is something that we are discovering more and more about ourselves and our owning and being able to articulate more, but you know, I think um, part of being brothers being kind of like soulmates joined together making art is it it we came up in a very different way from how Hollywood works or or traditional storytelling works in general you know in Hollywood there's this idea that the the director is a dictator and he's an auteur and um, they have to see and know everything and they usually have baseball caps and are chewing gum. They <laughs> smack gum it's this thing. loudly. A vest would also yeah. help. Um, <laughs> although this headset is helping with your auteur energy yeah. in general. Um, but, you know, Mark and I work in this different way where we, our egos, because you are joined, your egos have to go. Like, egos are the first thing that gets in the way of, like, making something when you're a partner with We someone. have none left. They were beaten out of us yeah, we all for 12 <laughs> years So of many failing. shitty movies. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's true. Yeah, we, they got beaten it's out of us. It's one of the us. best things that happened to us as artists, I think. Like, you know? failing very consistently for 10 years. When, when Jay and I come together with, with an exciting idea, the energy is so different. And I think people remark on it, too, because... It, it's very specifically not, I got it, let's do it, I know what to do, give me my space. It's, it's usually like, this feels like a good idea, parenthetical, but I've been wrong a thousand times, so I have no <laughs> idea if I'm right. Will you help me raise my C minus yeah. idea into something that will be communicable to an audience? And, and our whole, I mean, collaborating with each other has been that way for a long time. And I think what you know, we're talking about now is like, um, as, as togetherness opened up for us and, and gave us some space, we started to realize like, okay, we're soulmates, this is wonderful, we climbed a mountain together, but we have our own wives and our own children, and like Jay being on Transparent was a very big thing for us because like I always used to go out and act on movies and, and it was, I used to say it was like really fun because I could have an affair on our creative partnership and our marriage. And it felt really, really good. And Jay never got to do that. And then... Goddamn cuckold. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> right. And he went away to do Transparent. And I was like, he was like, I don't know if I should do this. I'm, I'm so busy. I don't know if I'm, if I'm, am I an actor? And I was like, you should absolutely do this. It's so great. Have a great time. And I watched him go. And plus, it was like, not a big deal. He was, I was going to do a web series, right? On like yeah. <laughs> Amazon.com, the place where you buy your toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, it'll be one season and it'll be done. There won't be any Golden Globes. There won't be. Um, and then when I watched him like, take off as an artist singularly and then make all these creative connections outside of me, it was so deeply threatening um, <laughs> in a way that like knocked me on the fucking floor. Like all day long, I could sit here and just be like, I love my brother, I want him to sail and have everything. Don't, no, no, don't go, don't go too far. And, and, and so the last three years of our partnership have been really interesting for us because we are trying to figure out how to be soulmates with space. Um, we, are, we are kind of um, consciously uncoupling, if you will. Um, <laughs> like Gwyneth Paltrow and that lovely man from Coldplay. <laughs> and um, we had to break up to find the love again. That's right. yeah. <laughs> and it's been, on Monday, we're like, this is so great, it's so wonderful. And then Tuesday, we get all nostalgic and we miss when it was just the two of us against the world and we were each other's everything. And then on Wednesday, it flips back again. And it's really, it's very emotional, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, the book is, I mean, it's kind of a breakup. Book. It is. I didn't want to say it until you guys did because it, it's a little bit of a spoiler because you go through that evolution in the yeah, book. Yeah, and but. I mean, to, I, I would say to say breakup maybe is like a little too far, but it's definitely like cracking open and trying to figure out where the space is. And the good news is, for us at least, is like 
this has allowed not only uh, good things for us personally, but professionally, we can now, we've like widened our circle of collaboration to our type, our gr groups of friends and types of filmmakers who know how to make things that we don't know how to make. So now our company can produce movies like Tangerine and movies, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start naming movies and you guys just start clapping every time. <laughs> if anybody has IMDB, just pull it up, we'll go through three <laughs> and then we'd all get out of here. It'll be great. <laughs> Um, but, but like Wild Wild Country was a great example of that where like we love documentaries and we've always wanted to be a part of them but most documentarians are broke and sad and we're kind of not willing to like do that full time. Um, <laughs> we don't want to ruin our lives but if you want to, yeah. we'll, we'll produce you. We'll give you an office yeah. and you can ruin your life in that office. <laughs> um, and that's been so great for us to be able to have enough space to kind of do those things. So. Um, it's definitely been bittersweet the whole time, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, def it's new. Yeah, I mean, the idea of a breakup is like, it's interesting because it's like, very specifically, I think what we are breaking up is this idea that we need to be lockstep in partnership and doing what, everything together. And by the way, no one told us that we, no. we, that we did that to ourselves. We did that, yeah. we, we, and we both subconsciously for the first 10 years of like being successful, we thought we were going to be the Cohen brothers. That's what we always wanted to be. We wanted to be, and then we realized we are the opposite of them, basically, as filmmakers. But we still wanted to be those two brothers who wrote and directed things in perpetuity, you know. And as we've come through, it's like I got on Transparent, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it. But I not only love this, but I love acting, and I want to do this for real, um, despite the fact that I hated all theater, theater people in high school. <laughs> um, but Mark, you know, and Mark has emerged as this brilliant producer who can, I mean, the way that he can model projects and the, and the way that he can, like, build a script and write the first draft of a script in no time flat. So we, we, we've both been kind of surprised at how we've differentiated from, and that writing-directing thing was primarily directing. I mean, the reason we started writing is so, so we have cool material to direct. The reason yeah. why we produced was so that we could show up on set and have it be built the way that we wanted to build it. And we've been surprised by how we've differentiated in our own interests and also in what we think we're particularly good at. Yeah. And that's been surprising. So it's, it's, it's less of, it's the breakup of that Coen Brothers, the idea of what we thought we were gonna be, but now we still have a company and it's like, the idea is like, how can we support each other in doing what we want to do most? And, hey, I have this, and I could really use your help in this area if you want to. And not limit each other in any way, because, you know, that lockstep thing that Jay's talking about, it was so critical to come from the suburbs of New Orleans, not knowing anything about how to be an artist, for us to have each other. And, and as Jay describes, and it's almost like that immigrant mentality. We were immigrants coming into Hollywood, and, like, stick with your family, stick close, subordinate any grievances or any differences because you don't belong here and you gotta fucking take lockstep together. And that was so great as we were building things, um, but we realized over the course of time that like um, the way that we operate, this is kind of specific, but something we get into the book, and I think it's important for those of you who are like collaborating, it took us a long time to figure this out, is that our taste levels have remained actually quite similar. But uh, as, as we've differentiated as people, we've, we've discovered not only different skill sets, but the way we operate. For instance, my brain is like kind of spastic and fireworksy, and, and it comes up with lots of different ideas, and this is all false, mil false you know, humility aside, like most of which are not good. A couple of them are really interesting, um, but it comes really fast. Um, and then Jay's brain a lot of times works in this way where like, if you give him space and time to do a deep dive into something, like he will find something unique that you can't find. But he can't often find that while my brain is just burning the shit out of his face while he's deep diving. <laughs> and likewise, like when Jay's deep diving, he's like putting out my fires and it's like cramping my style. And we had to like be honest with each other about that and be like, that 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 combination was great for a long time but also not also great for our happiness at times and so we've had to learn how to like you know i have to stay away from jay when he's like birthing something so i don't like light him on fire and he has to kind of stay away from me a little bit so he's like not like cramping my style while i'm while i'm burning up and 
you know, like, it's just, I mean, it, it, it sounds like one never-ending therapy session, and the only reason it sounds like that is because it absolutely is. <laughs> it's goddamn exhausting. It's fucking good. Yeah. Um, I want to um, switch it up and talk to you a little bit uh, just about improvisation yeah. and how important that is for your work. Yeah. Um, and you can respond to that in any way. I was thinking about it when you were describing how you're different from the typical Hollywood person and that that must be different for the people that you work with yeah. if you're yeah. showing up and make, and you know, That's they're right. expecting to be sort of put on a mark and told what to do and yeah. you're... Um, the core of it is that, for me at least, ours is a, is a process of discovery as opposed to a process of exacting a preconceived vision. Um, and we were a little naive when we went into Hollywood because everybody loved our movies out of Sundance and they said, well, we'll pay for your movies. And when we signed up to do Cyrus, which was like a $7 million studio movie, I think that we were naive thinking like, well, we'll just tell them, here's the script, but we'll, we'll improvise it and we'll discover it on set, we'll see you later. You know, and that kind of wasn't fair to them, I think. But at the same time, they had a hard time trusting us because we were first time studio makers, uh, studio filmmakers. And I think that um, they had a hard time believing that because we were willing to discover things, because we were willing to listen and be open and validate like we do with each other, they unfortunately interpreted that as either we were weak and could be steamrolled or we didn't have vision. And that was kind of a bummer that we discovered then, that we didn't really fit that well in that system. And like the one night that they really pushed us hard, like I actually lost my shit and started yelling. And that was when they unfortunately were like, oh, these guys have vision. Oh. Oh, they know what they're doing. They okay, they're never mind. Doing. They're yelling. And we're good. That, we're good. And, and the fact that that works <laughs> almost killed us. Yeah. And so immediately at that point, we realized that Playing with other people's mind. Was that a sneeze? That was really, that was a great one. Um, <laughs> um, playing with other people's money was like almost not fair to them because we want to be able to discover and definitely not fair to us because they were going to have to like have all the answers when we wouldn't get them until we got to set. And improvisation is a big, big part of that. And it really informed the business model we have today, which is we rode the, the hill up to Sundance, and then we said, oh, we made a movie that sold at Sundance, now we go into the studio system, we made two in there, and then we're like, we're not gonna last here. <laughs> we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna have heart attacks and we're gonna burn out. So we turned right back around, went right back down into the independent sphere, and, um, and discovered a really new way of making movies for us, which was like, if we just make these cheaply and use some of the money that we've made either on writing gigs or I was on that show, The League, for a while, which like really helped like pay for a lot of our projects. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep saying project names, I gotta do that. Um, and then we started realizing like, oh, let's not make it for $7 million at Fox Searchlight. Let's make it for $100,000 on our own. And then everybody works for like a pretty good day rate and then they share massive profits in the movie. And then we'll go to Sundance and sell it for like a big amount and then everybody shares in the profits and that that system came out of us essentially kind of failing in the studio system but i would say that the improv is part of a bigger system which is just like us kind of making things up as we go you know um we failed for so long we're partners we are when we're on set we're not looking to exact words that were written a year ago in or some, three years ago in some yeah. fugue state we're trying to like make an environment where lightning and strike and can strike and we can like achieve some level of reality um so that's on the acting side so i mean if anything the improvisation is it's it's goal is it's goal-based improvisation where actors are we're just trying to achieve something that's real in the moment and we feel like that is probably the thing that we do uniquely have to offer as filmmakers is a scene where you see it and you're like, that was real. Because it was. Uh, and, and the actors to didn't a know yeah. exactly what was going to happen. Um, but the system of also like being vulnerable on set as a director and saying, like, you know what, I don't know. You know what, I think this part of the scene is broken. And I think... Um, 
I don't, I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to fix it. We're going to go it. walk around the block. We're going to go. Studios hog. love that. They love it. That's <laughs> their love favorite it. when you tell them. And that. actors have a hard time too. I mean, I think, I think what Mark and I have learned how to do is live in chaos on set. And you work know? with what's working too is a big part of it yes, too. Yes, go with what's working. But it, it, everyone on set wants you to move on. Your best friends on set, every, every single person that is on a film set comes up to you and like, are we good? Did we get it? Did we, we get move it? On? That's the question. And these are all people that we love and they love us, but like all the pressure in the world is to move on. And people are like, well, when did you sell it? It's like, you, you, you can sell out at every, that, every that's second. That's how bad movies are made, is caving to the pressure of, did we get it? And somewhere in your brain, you're like, maybe we didn't get it, but a hundred people will love me if I say, yes, we got it, and we can end on budget and on schedule. And you do that, and then you make a turd. That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> We've made so many. We know yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, from the book, I know that the process of discovering that that's what you were looking for came relatively early in your career. It felt really your, late no, at the late. time. I know, you keep saying yeah. years and years, but... 29. Uh, I was 29. Jay was 29. And I, I had been... And we had been making movies consistently and editing movies, and we had made a few shorts and a couple of digital features. Yep. Uh, and then it wasn't, you know, w w basically what happened we put, was... We, is, those are premiering in our mom's basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, tickets are a million dollars. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically what happened was, is, I mean, I was at the end of my rope. Mark was approaching it. You know, I was about to turn 30, and I was just kind of done, you know? I was like, I, I've, I've dragged myself through this enough. I've dragged Mark and my parents through it enough. Like, it's embarrassing, you know? Like, all my friends are getting married and having kids and buying houses and be thriving, and I'm work living off of $15,000 a year in peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know? And it was that day that Mark who has always been, you know, he's, he's always the gas in our relationship, and he was like, we're going to make a movie today. And I was like, this is early 2000s when digital wasn't out yet, and, you know, I was like, we don't have a 16-millimeter camera, we don't have lights, we don't have people. You needed to have people to do it. And Mark's idea was like, well, we have mom and dad's home video camera. Um, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven, and I'm going to buy a tape and you're gonna come up with an idea by the time I come back. And I ran out <laughs> very quickly. And I left him holding the bag, which is um, something I'm very good at. So this is like, you know, we're at the, we're at the end of our rope here, and um, I was at the end of my wits, and I didn't have the luxury of intellectualizing an idea, approximating the Cohen brothers. I didn't have any of that. I had an apartment, and a video camera and Mark. And so the only, the thing that came to me was something that had happened to me two weeks prior, which is that I tried to perfect the personal, gr I, I tried to record my outgoing answering message, which on an actual answering machine, this is how old this was. And, um, and I failed to do so. I, it took me many attempts and I had a nervous breakdown <laughs> in the middle of it. Um, and, uh, and Mark came back and I told him uh, about the idea and he said, okay, uh, I'm gonna go get dressed when I come in the door, roll camera. And should we show it? Yeah. This is Let's what Let's take happened. a look at the results. Yeah. <laughs> is my head in the way?
Hi, this is John. Hi, this is John Ashford. This is John Ashford at 512. Hi, this is John. Hello, you've reached John Ashford at 512-443-9321. I'm sorry I've missed your call. Please leave me your name and number, and I will return your call as soon as possible. Hi, this is John Ashford at 512-416-9754. I'm sorry I've missed your call. Please leave me your name and number, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you. John, um, sorry I've missed your call, but I will return your call as soon as possible. Call, call, call. Hey, this is John Ashford. I'm sorry I've missed your call, but if you leave me your name and number, I will get back to you as soon as humanly possible. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry I've missed your call, but if you could um, leave your... It's John Ashford. <laughs> hey, it's John. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your number. I'll give you a call back later. Thanks. Hi, this is John. I'm sorry I missed your call. Uh, no big deal. I'll call you back when... Um, when I get in, and just leave me a message. Take care. This is John Ashford. This is 4169754. I regret to inform you I am not home at the moment. This is John Ashford. I'm not home. John. Um. your message, okay? So, let's buck up here and fucking bite the bullet <clears throat> and make this happen, alright? I know you can do this, so let's just, come on, okay? There's nothing to be afraid of. Okay. Hi, 
this is John. Well, this is my last chance, so I can't stop now. I can't seem to get this to work for me, and I really don't know why. But <clears throat> this is my last try, so I guess this is going to be what you're hearing. I don't really, you know, I don't care what you think because I'm not afraid anymore. You know? I had a, a long day and I'm not home right now. If you leave me your name and number, <clears throat> I will call you back. Thank you. And have a great fucking day. stay through all the credits yeah yeah <laughs> all those crew members deserve your respect <laughs> um, as you can see um, it was not the the best looking movie to play at the Sundance Film Festival that year but it was also the worst sounding movie to there play was that, at Sundance, there was that so. <laughs> and then I think there's a dead pixel in the center there if you notice um, but that was you know that was kind of um, crazy for us because obviously that was the cost of the tape and we submitted it to Sundance on a lark um, and we got in that year and then we felt like we don't belong here this must be a mistake and then like we won the short film award that year and 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 we have stayed very close to this process um, as much as we could through our careers because First of all, we just were scared if we strayed from it, we'd fail again. Um, and, and we sort of incrementally built everything from here. Our next short the next year was, um, there were two actors in that one, which was crazy. It was still in a kitchen. Still shot it in a kitchen. Yeah. Um, and then we did our feature, The Puffy Chair, which kind of followed the same ethic, really cheaply made. And we just kind of tried to take things like very slowly and, in and incrementally, but always for us, what was the priority is we realized all those movies we were trying to make before, we tried to make a, a movie about a runner from South Texas, and we just, we weren't authorities on those subjects, but this is like what we uniquely had to offer. <laughs> this is basically the tragic comedy of our lives and persecuting ourselves on film tended to work, you know? And, um, and I think that like, you know, a lot of people are always asking us like, you know, how did you find your stuff? What is the thing, you know? And we're always feel like, like, Somewhere around like two o'clock in the morning when you're having that conversation with someone you're very, very close with, when they're admitting to you, oh my God, I had a nervous breakdown when I was trying to perfect the personal greeting in my answer machine. And you giggle about it and you, somebody cries a little bit. That's stuff that feels like so personal to you that you couldn't possibly even communicate it to people. That's probably where you should start. It's yeah, I mean, this was like shown at Sundance at a time. I mean, like the stuff at Sundance is still pretty heavy hitting, but back in the day, like, it was mostly hardcore dramas, yeah. you know? This was playing like the Christmas Eve screening of Dumb and Dumber at yeah. Sundance. <laughs> it was like people, but it was a weird screening because you guys know it ended well because we're here and stuff, but we were having, the audience, like half the audience thought he was gonna kill himself. Yep. <laughs> so then people were like cringing and then laughing and then say, don't laugh, don't laugh. <laughs> this is gonna end bad. It was like this wild, crazy moment. And yeah. it was uniquely what we had to offer is our own pathetic shit just yeah. like yeah. thrown up there. And like, I guess we, like, we talk about this a little bit, but probably not enough is like, I think part of the reason we got to that place is that we just like, we never left the bus stop. We waited at the fucking bus stop for years and years and years. We ran out of bad ideas, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then got stuck with this like, good one, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm, you, you described how you sort of 
passed through the studio system, mm -hmm. going back to doing in more independent work so you could work like this. I, I have to admit I was honestly surprised that you can still manage to keep this level of openness in your work, you know, that's just by its nature, because it does cost more than $3, yeah. a little more, little more circumscribed. I, I had a conversation with an actress who was in an episode of Room 104. Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, yeah, they, they sent me the script. And I, I did it, cause I took it because I really loved the script. And then I got to the set and Mark was like, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna <laughs> use that script. Yeah. We're just gonna improvise. Um, we used to get in trouble with that on Togetherness, like Amanda Peet all the time. We'd be like, dude, why aren't we doing the script? It's so good. We're like, because you practice it in the mirror, and now we have to change it so it looks totally fresh. And you'll do, you'll do it so much better than our words because it will be new, but you'll have ingested what our intention was. So it's not like she's like improvising about like, you know, chocolate-covered toasters to, for comedy. She's improvising the dramatic core of the scene, but every time she's doing it, she's fumbling over her words, and it just... I don't know, we, we just love documentaries, so we're always trying to have our narratives approximate that feeling of freshness that, that documentaries have for us. Well, let's talk about your love of documentaries and some of your mentoring work. That's what I, I mean, that's the way it seems to me, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but at this point in your careers, you're doing a lot of executive producing, yeah. you're helping other filmmakers get their work done. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you started doing that, why you like doing that, yeah. how you choose what films you're going to help? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely similar to everything else we do where we accidentally stumbled upon it, like we accidentally stumbled upon this thing, you know. Uh, the first thing that we produced was a film for Brian Poyser, who was a, uh, in film school with us in UT Austin. And we happened to be um, getting paid to write Cyrus at the time. And he called us and he said, hey, guys, I'm making an $18,000 movie. Uh, $5,000 of funding just dropped out. We shoot tomorrow. And if I don't get $5,000, the movie dies. And so for Mark and me, at that point, it was literally just money. It was just like, oh, we can both afford $2,500. And so we gave him the money. And then we did what we always do is we you know, consulted on edits. We weren't on set at all, but, you know, he's a good filmmaker and we believe in him and wanted to see the movie get made. And, um, and then his movie actually got into competition at Sundance and they, they were uh, called us executive producers. And we were like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're producers. We, and, and it, but it, And even, we bought blazers. So, <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> It's See? important. I oh, still got his. <laughs> got my yeah. blazer, producer blazer on. Yeah. It was, um, that was the start of it, honestly. It was just like sort of accidental. We were the first people in our peer group to make money. And, um, you know, we, we also were the first people to like get grinded through the industry. We were the first people to like sell movies at Sundance. So it was just like, we just started at answering questions and helping people and honestly having survivor's guilt and trying to help them avoid all the potholes that we stepped in and yeah. along the way. That was a big part of it. And then there's this other more selfish part of it now for us, which is like working with, you know, younger or less experienced or hungrier filmmakers, whatever age they might be, kind of juices us up a little bit too because they bring something new to the equation that we don't quite understand yet or that we've lost, you know. And so some forms of the collaborations are like, I make these little movies called Creep with my friend Patrick Bryce, who was just, thank you, he was just out of film school. He didn't know anything, but he was brilliant, really nice. And so there was a lot of mentoring and like teaching him how to make those movies. And then now he's just like flown the coop and he's solid and can do whatever he wants. Um, but again, there are other things we do similar to what Brian Porzer did or like when we were mentioning Tangerine and Wild Wild Country where fully formed great filmmakers are coming to us. The, I mean, the, the boys who made Wild Wild Country, we call them the boys because they're like 10 years younger than us, um, <laughs> they, they took it all over town. They're and bald with gray hair. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> exactly. <the sides. laughs> no one wanted to buy Wild Wild Country. They took it over and no one, everybody passed on it. And so like 
we had one very clear job to do. I would love to take all the creative credit for that show, but we can't. Like, we gave them cash. We gave them um, full creative control and protection, set them up at Netflix, who's comfortable to give us Final Cut, which we're like, great, okay, boys, take the Final Cut, go ahead. And, you know, they moved into our office spaces on the east side of L.A., and that's where we're editing, like, Room 104, and, and so they're meeting other filmmakers and testing their episodes on them and involved in a community, and, and, and that's really all we had to do to kind of give them that little leg up they needed. And so that's something we're really excited to be able to do now because, frankly, it doesn't require, like, a huge amount of time for us when you're really, like, giving it to people who are so hungry and willing to go for it. And then as to shows like Room 104, that's been really great for us because it's a way for us to still feel really creative. Like, you know, we're still writing a ton of those scripts, but we don't really direct a lot of those episodes and we hand them off to, like, we're trying to, f that's one where we can very easily support, like, women filmmakers and persons of color given their first directing job in the industry. And our feeling is, like, we're very experienced directors and we're good at it, but like the 27 year old Sundance short filmmaker who gets their first chance at this, the way that they prepare, the enthusiasm they bring to it is just as good of a chance that they're gonna do it as good, if not better than us because of like how excited they are for it. And so we've kind of realized like delegation through the years has been like a really fun part of the producing process where, you know, I think again, we, we've said this a lot, but in the early part of our career we felt like we gotta write and direct everything and do it so it's gonna be good and, and now we're kind of like, there's a lot of really talented people out there. We just need to embolden them and give them the, the step. I mean, there's a, there's a small irony having read the book where you know, one of your messages to filmmakers is like, don't wait for the cavalry yes. to come. Like, just go out, yes. do your thing, don't wait for the cavalry. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting because for some people now you are the cavalry. We are. Yeah. But we still don't think they should wait for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't wait for us. I mean, uh, th there are so many people who put all their hopes and dreams into, like, one movie, for instance. There was a very common model when we were coming up um, where this is back in the early 2000s, and you will know this model so well, where people spend six to seven years preparing and raising money to make a $500,000 Super 16 millimeter movie. This is happening in various other formations, but back in the Through early the years, 2000s, yeah. this was the thing that would destroy filmmaker after filmmaker. You just watch them topple. And what would happen is, is they would spend six or seven years raising money and they're no longer a filmmaker. They are not practicing what they have come to do. They're, they're good at fundraising now. Um, and, and bullshitting and, and talking. And bullshitting. Yeah. And so two things happen is they show up on set and they're not really a practiced filmmaker anymore. And number two, they're sick of their script that they wrote six years ago and the movie would be mediocre and they'd never ever make another movie again because you can't recover from a half a million dollar loss, yeah. you know? So like in the advent of like, you know, digital filmmaking, it doesn't have to cost $500,000, but people do that. And the one thing that Mark and I always try to say is, you know, make stuff cheaply so that you can fail and pick yourself back up and do it again. And that's probably the only thing that is the reason why we're here today. Is we had a couple of expensive ones in there. Those hurt pretty I mean, bad. yeah, we had a $70,000 <laughs> movie in there. That was by far the most expensive. All of yeah. other of the failures All of were, the were cheap. Yeah. were very, very cheap. Yeah. Um, and that was because we had made this, we made $70,000 and we just threw it into a, a movie. But um, yeah, I think, um, allowing yourself to fail because I mean there's this myth that you're gonna wake up one morning and you're gonna take a crap and a mo good movie's gonna come out or a bad movie's gonna come out and that's gonna determine whether you're a good filmmaker or not but that's crazy this is the most complex art form that I can imagine the amount of talents that you have to synthesize in order to make a movie like no one expects a painter to like make one painting but I think it's, the, it's because of the culture that we live in. We've all seen so many movies and we relate to them in this really intimate way. So we just think that we can create them. But the truth is, is that there's so much craft in it. And it takes time. It takes time and it Get takes failure. It. And yeah. it takes a continuing communication with your audience. I mean, look, the filmmakers that 
are coming through Room 104. They haven't had one short film at Sundance or one feature totally. at Sundance. They've had many, many, many films. And it surprises us, actually. I think that's probably the most unique thing about us is that when we were coming up, we expected, we were, we expected to fail. Yeah. And when we made a shitty movie, we were aware that it was a shitty movie. You know, Even when we shot this, we weren't like, oh, this is great. We did it. When we shot this, we were like, wow, that was different. That was interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was, it was that feeling, and, and I will say personally behind the camera, it was the first time ever behind the camera that I laughed and cried during a take. And that, you know, Mark could feel that, and we were whispering in community, you know, just, we knew that something big had happened on camera, and that it came to fruition. It was, there was a beginning and a middle and an yeah. end, but we didn't really know what it meant, you know. But it, it was because we showed it to our friends, and David Zellner, one of the Zellner brothers, actually edited it for us, because we were so beat up that we were just like, what is this? And he's like, he watched the footage, and he was like, this is incredible, and he cut it up in probably 40 minutes. Yeah, well, he was way more advanced as a filmmaker than we were at the time, and Again, luckily, our egos had been beaten out of us enough that we didn't say, like, no, we should see this through because it's ours. We were just like, yes, please help us. <laughs> yeah. And, like, it, it, it just, I don't know. I mean, like, we have this big house where all of our movies edit and work, and, like, there's, like, a screening every two or three nights there where we just invite the smartest people we know, come on in, tell us what's wrong with what we're doing, and help us fix it. Our whole philosophy, for better or for worse now, is, like, if we can somehow manage to get it to 75 or 80 percent and use our smart peers to help us get it the rest of the way, that's what our job is. Yeah, it's brilliant. Our non-brilliance is brilliant. <laughs> Your non-brilliance is brilliant. Uh, all right, so we're going to open it up to questions in a minute, but before we do that, I just, um, you uh, don't seem to be slowing down at all or very much. You have like a we kind four, of are. You, you are, because kind of I mean, you, I was going to ask you to tell us what's coming right. up. It's not going to sound like we're slowing down when, when we talk about Yes, up. exactly. And uh, I, I did read about one of your Netflix flix films, which is, was described as a bittersweet bromance. Um, People love the word bromance. I know, they We do. made a movie about male intimacy, guys. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. No, but so tell us a, a little a, bit about... Uh, uh, the filmmaker who I made the movie Blue Jay with, with Sarah Paulson. Thank you. Um, we made another movie together. It stars me and Ray Romano. It's a kind of a, a deep dive into a male, uh, special male friendship. Um, and we make us a, a slate of four original movies for Netflix every like year and a half or so. We have a new season of um, Romano 4 coming back in the fall. We have a new season of Animals coming back in the fall, our animated show. Um, we just released this movie called Outside In. The, yes. Uh, thank you. That Lynn Shelton directed and I wrote with her. Um, stars Jay and Edie Falco. It's very, very good. Um, I know Edie Falco, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. But she doesn't know you, so it's fine. <laughs> um, you didn't have to tell them that. Yeah, you forgot to wear your blazer. To that I movie. mean, but to be specific, though, I, I mean, I, honestly, like, not directing takes so much pressure off the, uh, off the equation. Yeah, it's I mean, been like five or six years since we've directed a movie, mm -hmm. and we're kind of honing it. We have a company of, like, ten people now. Um, and they do a lot of different things for us, and we talked a lot about delegating, but um, you know, what we're able to do now by not having that singularity of focus is like spread it around and do quite a few different projects. You know? um, so that's really uh, you know, helped us focus on, again, what we really love doing. It's like Jay writing movies for, for him to star in and, and doing these acting projects and really exploring that thing that he's kind of surprisingly fall in love with, you know, later in life. And then, and, and I personally am like, my kids are 10 and six and, and I like being more nine to five and being home with them. And so acting and directing is not as much in the cards for me right now because of those long days. And I also feel like, honestly, like I'm a, I'm a good director, but I can be replaced. And so if I feel that way, I'm like, great, give it to somebody else. I'm a good actor. I can be replaced. Give it to somebody else. I have like two things that I really focus in on that I think I like feel, I'm not a religious person, but I like feel like the Lord in me when I'm, when I'm doing them, which is like when I'm barfing out a vomit draft of a first script, I, you know, you just know you're like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Like I, can, I can get a C minus draft out really quickly 
and I know how to build projects with filmmakers. I can really, like, each project is like a little startup, you know, and I can kind of be like, oh, Sean Baker and $100,000 and the iPhone and this community, and I'll put them with this sale, do, 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 poof, and go, you know. And so I've tried to just do those things that I feel like I'm uniquely good at. Great. Uh, all right. Uh, now we're going to take some questions from the audience. We have microphones. So Ooh, we have microphones. Since they're, or you can, no, no, since no. they're live streaming, please oh, wait right, till they right. get to okay, the microphone no, so the people. <laughs> we're streaming, guys. We're live streaming, so and it's if, important. If you can, if it seems all the questions are in the center, so please come out to an aisle. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who it's are a just joining like us on our live stream, the fourth the row is very People excited. Are walking out <laughs> oh, the aisle right they're now. They're inspiring. We, we can, can do the start first over here. Right over here. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi. Hi there. Um, major fan. I first came across your work via Lynn Shelton. So, um, and I've come to love it. And it means so much to me. Um, as a sibling, I have to ask about the Dodeca pentathlon. Um, did you find growing up that you had similar competitions? Um, growing up, I mean, is this competitive spirit as brothers? Did that kind of... We, yeah. we were not that competitive as no. brothers, um, but we, the Dodecapentathlon is a, is a very small movie that we made that was based on a true story of two brothers who grew up down the street for, uh, from us who were like Irish twins who were beating the shit out of each other constantly, competing constantly. And so they created a fake 25 event Olympics like one of the events being Indian leg wrestling. Um, to one of the key events. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be clear. Our key event. Uh, yes. To determine who was the better brother for all time, and that's, that's what it was based on, and it's totally real and insane. But there was, no, there was no competition or any aggressive stuff like that because Jay is four years older than me, or almost four years older than me, and like that's where it started. He was so good to me and so inclusive and and like that's that's how our relationship began was was really it started with jay the next question is on your left hi um are you gonna hold it okay great <laughs> great you um, don't get that microphone <laughs> I, i'm gonna i'm gonna do the power stance while i talk to you um and by the way, clock's so, ticking, yo, so okay i'm gonna get it out i'm gonna get it out i'm gonna get it out <laughs> Um, I'm an independent filmmaker. Um, one of my shorts just screened at the IFC Center um, in New York City this past week. And now I'm trying to think of who to talk to next. And I know that you guys are reaching out and scooping out like hungry filmmakers as myself. And I was just wondering, do you take things that are unsolicited or how do people, how do you connect yeah, it's with a really, this community? It's a really good question. You know, because, the, yeah. We're an, we're an odd company in that like, you know, everybody's like, how do you guys do so much? Do you ever sleep? And we do sleep. And one of the reasons we sleep is we don't, we don't um, develop traditionally like any companies. We don't like um, accept scripts to read and we don't like have, you know, people that we don't really know pitch to us because it just unfortunately sucks up so much time, you know? And a lot of times what we do is we're working with people who have come into our orbit or whose work that we have discovered and we build projects internally so that we actually make 100% of what we develop and there's no waste with time. So as much as like when you say that, like literally my heart starts to crack and it's like, yes, we should, we should, we, sh we should work together. But then my answer is like, the truth is like you made a great short film that played at the IFC Center. You were on your way. You should not be thinking about anyone, not people like us or anyone to help you along the way. You should be having something that you might like to make and you might get help with, but always have something actionable that you can make that's the next step up. So I would just say, personally, whatever that short was that you made that clearly clicked with people, take the tone of that, take the seed of that, and try and find a way to make a feature film that is under $1,000 micro-budgeted that you can make and own and get that into the next festival, and then you'll sell that for $10,000 and then you'll take that next $9,000 and go make another movie and you'll build this thing brick by brick and you will never have to ask people like us whether we take submissions. The next question is on your right. Uh, I know it's often a point of contention between production companies and Netflix that Netflix won't share like viewership data 
and things like that. Does that bother you all at all? And do you even think about that or care? No, we don't care. No. We'd We're, love to know, but like, I mean, people are always asking us those questions and more specifically, are you upset about the death of theatrical distribution? And the truth is, is like, we have zero entitlement. We feel it's like it's crazy that we're here and that we are being paid to make movies. And I, I just genuinely just feel like it's, it's nobody's idea that theatrical distribution is dying. It, it, it's just it's what, what people what are, doing. are doing. Everyone in this room is watching shit on their laptop. And everybody needs to stop whining about it because we're all doing it. Yeah. Like, why are we whining about it, yeah, you know? We, it's it's really true. I mean, the the major complaints we f we find from other independent filmmakers, we find to be either usually due to entitlement, f feeling like they are owed something that we kind of feel like they're not, um, or something that's like really unreasonable. Like they won't greenlight my twelve million dollar incest movie with no stars in it, <laughs> and it's like they shouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> you should go make it for a thousand dollars on an iPhone and prove them wrong. Like, I, Sorry. I wish our movies were playing theatrically. I mean, like, The Puffy Chair was a $10,000 movie that played in 150 movie theaters and, like, had a four-month run in Portland yeah. and a, you know, five-month run in Austin. It was amazing. That doesn't happen anymore. But, like, to me, there's so many more advantages to where we are now, specifically the democratization of filmmaking. I mean, any human being with an iPhone and a laptop is now empowered to make a really good looking movie. So that now like the limits to making a good piece of art is simply your own personal creativity and that's it. <laughs> so I, I think that's an incredible place to be personally in terms of where we're at. The next question is on your left. This uh, next question might make me seem like a jerk because it's probably more directed than Mark, but um, I, wa <laughs> I wanted to... <laughs> um, Bring it in, Mama. Bring you it in. <laughs> you talked about Creep a little bit earlier, and obviously I, I want to know so much about making that movie, but um, I more, more wanted to know about process-wise because from a content perspective, it's completely different from the stuff that you've done. Yeah. But from a process perspective, it seems really similar. Like it seems really improvisational mm -hmm. and uh, you know, single camera. And I was just wondering what that was like. Well, the, the critical process difference was that we went all the way back to sort of like the childlike days where it was just me and my friend Patrick. We were a two person crew making that movie where he, you know, he was filming and I was the actor and it was, and the reason I wanted to do it that way is because he was totally unproven and if we failed it wouldn't hurt his feelings and it wouldn't hurt my pocketbook. So that was really nice and, and was able to be able to take big creative swings like that. Um, and uh, you know, as to the content of it, it's really good that you bring that up because we thought the, ori the original Creep movies were called Peach Fuzz, okay? And we thought they were going to be an odd Craigslist encounter that ended in a nice resolution of their friendship, right? And we shot for six days and we edited it together and we showed people and they were like, this movie wants to go dark. And we were like, we don't want to go dark. We want them to be buddies. And they were like, you're not obeying the energy of your movie. Go back and obey what this movie wants you to do. And when we did surrender to it, we realized that they were right. And that movie was massively made by committee. In a, in a great way, like a smart peers who told us what to do. Next question on your right. Hi, I was a big fan of Togetherness, and I was very disappointed when there wasn't a season three. So I was curious how much had already been written, how much had already been planned for that season, and is there any way that those of us who really enjoyed it could ever find that out? <laughs> <laughs> um, how much you got? Yeah. <laughs> Let's take up a collection, guys. Let's start talking um, about it. Pass the fire <laughs> Pass the basket around. Um, we were devastated also by the cancellation. Uh, we were, we probably written about four scripts into season three. We had the whole season broken. The whole we story. had the whole season broken out. Uh, that being said, um, Mark and I wrote and directed and produced every single episode. Mark starred in every single episode. The show was killing us. We did, at that point in time, we didn't know how to be the showrunners of a $22 million show. Uh, the only thing that we knew how to do was to make stuff with our hands. 
um, and it it was killing us. It was it was a lot of work. So we were like kind of secretly, personally relieved when it ended. Um, but and also, I don't know if this brings any consolation, but. For season three, we knew we weren't going to be able to write and direct and produce every single episode, so we were going to be backing out and hiring other people to do do that stuff. And I think it would have been really different. I don't think we would have been I think able. It, I I agree. I think it would have gotten, quite honestly, less good. And I think that if HBO had continued to green light it, we wouldn't have been able to turn down the money, and we would have continued to make it and make it less and less good. And honestly, we're we're kind of. I think it ended at the right spot where we were able to really author the whole thing. And, and just let it go and, when it was at its peak. To be clear, it's not gonna be, it wasn't going to be less good because other people aren't as good as directors as we are. It, it was the fact that we were making it in this very homemade immigrant way, as we were describing, and we were going to try and turn it into a big show. I mean, even Room 104 is not, it's not constructed like a traditional HBO show with a showrunner and a whole writer's room and a slew of directors who are coming in and out and people don't know where they are. Um, it was just going to be a different animal. And so in the end, the way that we feel about it, honestly, those first two seasons were we had all of those, all of those episodes in mind when we created the show. And for us, we did come to the end of what we had envisioned and feel good about it. Like the way we view it now is like a pretty badass miniseries, basically. But in season four, in season three, episode four, when they land on the moon. <laughs> yeah, that's shit. It's dope. It's dope. The next question is on your left. Hi, um, I've noticed uh, that some of the work that you do um, yourself, that, that you're very hands-on with, and in particular the puffy chair and togetherness, the storytelling is um, relatively delicate, it seems. And I, I wonder if you have a philosophy around narrative or story, um, and if so, how that developed and if it has changed over time. I think our philosophy is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it, but the, the one thing that I can say that we talk about is the subtlest version of something that we'll communicate. Um, there's a lot of stuff baked into r documentary realism, and we are actually wildly obsessed with plot, but plot that is um, extremely human and intricate. And, you know, the epically small plotting of our daily lives, you know, the, the devastations that we experience in a disappointment about a relationship that does feel like death. I mean, I think that's what we learned when we did this answering machine thing. It's like, we didn't, you don't have to kill 100 people to experience like the death and rebirth of like a person, you know? But it's hard to get there. If you test your movies in a traditional studio way, what, what you get in order to get a high test score is, is something that is slightly hyperbolic so it will communicate to everyone. And the delicacy I think you're talking about is when we show episodes of togetherness or things we've made to people, we try to do something really subtle, we watch it play, and then we say, did, did you catch that? And then they're like, ah, no, I missed that. So then we go back in editorial and we dial it up a little bit, and then we test it again. So we just try and, we don't take it so far that it's definitely gonna connect. We just try to get it just close enough. And if they say we're hitting them over the head, we'll bring it down. We'll bring it like, back down. We're yeah. trying to get away with stuff, basically, or only have things, this is a long conversation, but in a dream world, you're not perceiving any plot changes, they're like happening in your subconscious, but they're like taking you with them, if that makes any sense. Can I interrupt the flow of audience mm -hmm. questions? Because I- I'd You like may not, next question. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I want you to talk a little bit more about this getting feedback from your really smart peers, because it's obviously such an important yeah. part of your process. and. To me, it's one of the things that's always really interesting about being a creative person because you have to know what 
feedback to take and what yes. to ignore. So even though you've set it up with people that you all think are smart, there must be times when people there give are. you feedback and you're like, no, that doesn't feel right. So yeah, how do yes. you navigate that? We're in the middle right now of uh, testing all the season two and season three episodes of Room 104 on people. And um, every now and then we get one of those where there's like 26 people in the room and half of them wanted to go one way and half of them wanted to go the other way. And we're like, shit, we didn't get the thing that we hoped we would get. Um, and then we have to kind of figure out what to do and un go on our instinct. So that does happen. But more often than not, we find that if you're honest um, with yourself and you talk to the audience and you give them some cards and read back in their cards too, 85, 90% of them will tell you kind of where they want it to go. But it's and a very specific feedback that we're pursuing. It's not like, did you like it? No, I didn't like it. Okay, we'll cut the scene. It's more, it's more of what we were talking about before where we get up after the thing screens and we talk back and we have, it's basically where, it's what I think a lot of filmmakers forget to do is that your movie is a communication with an audience full of strangers three years later. It's a very weird thing it, to, to have that communication. And so we're trying to bring the audience into the room sooner. So we're asking you questions like, hey, when he said this to her, how did it make you feel? And were you with her or were you with him? Yeah. Okay, were you upset with him? And then we'll be like, uh, we'll discover, oh, they didn't link that back to that moment at minute 20 because it was too subtle. Yeah, yeah, we dropped away. these breadcrumbs. Shit, were you we feeling that? Oh, yeah, yeah. We dial up those breadcrumbs. They weren't feeling that. And again, I think there's like 10 filmmakers out there who know how to just do that on their own and take it out. And we hate those people. They're so amazing. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a really good way to put it. Sorry. Next question over here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm very excited to read this book because I have a four-year-old, and the last book that I read was three years ago, How to Sleep, Train Your Child. Dude, <laughs> my kids are 10 and 6, and, like, I got my books back, and, like, I've read, like, 50 books in the last two years. It's congratulations. Yeah, this is it's this so <laughs> number one. Number one, thank you. I can't read anymore. I just gave up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope I can still read. I don't even know. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um... This is a bold statement, but Togetherness is, in my opinion, the best show that I've seen in the last 10 years, and I was obsessed with it. Um, and Thank all you. I did after I saw it was talk about it. I own a store, and a customer would come in and be like, how's your kid? And I'd be like, did you watch Togetherness? I, <laughs> I, it's, it's, it was, it's the most real, the most honest, the relationship. I've never seen relationships portrayed that way between a husband and wife, between friends. Thank you, because it you. was... That's it was really amazing, nice and it was a great escape, but also I was like, maybe I need marriage counseling. <laughs> um, and then I just have a quick question. I was on the plane recently with my four-year-old, and um, I watched Room 104, the episode with the child and the nanny. Oh, no. And okay? I am still freaked out. Okay. <laughs> Can you just say anything about that episode? And, like, it just seems so... I don't know, it's different than anything it. else I've ever seen of yours. Yes. Um, what we will say about Room 104 is um, it was an opportunity for us after Togetherness to break out into different types of storytelling forms that we hadn't done before, an opportunity for us to collaborate more widely with people. Um, and so I think that for a long time, Jay and I felt for better or for worse that we should stay on brand as we were building ourselves in this industry that people saw the puffy chair and they liked that. So they want to see a certain kind of thing from us so that we could build and maintain success. And Room 104 was very much us being like, fuck all that. Let's just try some wildly different things. And Room 104 was a script that was uh, written uh, very quickly on, I'm sorry, the, that episode you're talking about was a script that was written very quickly on Instinct. And we gave it to a filmmaker who's a much darker person than us and a much more <laughs> visually interesting person than us. And we threw it in the pot and let it cook up. That's really what it is. Oh, thanks. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Hi. Um, okay. So, like, where I come from, it's a very smallish, like, more, you know, people aren't really focused on filmmaking. They're focused on nursing and accounting kind of thing. And when you're limited to that kind of community, like you have your small group of people that want to do this, like, but maybe they're not as confident or um, just secure going into a project. Um, 
like I have my brother, my small group of friends, how do you get the best performances out of these inexperienced people? That's and even with yourself, question. because there's times where I'm trying to direct people and it's just like, we're starting out, we have no clue what oh, we're doing. It, and it's like it's no such outlet. such a great question. And I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked that because we didn't figure this out for a long time. We would write things that we hoped um, we could cast but then we realized, well, we don't really even have any actors that we can fill in this. And then we would just grab a friend who was misappropriated into that task. They felt bad about it because they weren't good. We felt bad because it wasn't good. Um, and so when we wrote The Puffy Chair, very specifically, we said, well, what's a story we can tell with Mark, um, my girlfriend at the time, Katie, who I'm now married to, and Jay's really good friend, Rhett, who was in, who was in an acting class. So rather than just write three random roles, we wrote specifically tailored parts for us that we knew we could soar in. And we also wrote specific storylines that had what we call the available material school of filmmaking all the props around us. I owned a van because I was a musician. We wrote for the two apartments we had. So if you could take out a sheet of loose leaf and just the actors or whoever is willing to be in your movie, try to think honestly about like, what do they excel in? Is there something that they do that they're just like, you know. Or, they, what, or more simply, what do you want to see them yeah, do? Yeah, what do you want to see them do? And you kind of feel like they'll be really good at doing. We you know? wrote Cyrus for John C. Riley because we had heard that he liked the puffy chair. This is how random this shit is. <laughs> he kept, we kept getting these like communications yeah. from people that John C. Riley was not only watching the puffy chair repeatedly, but forcing other people to watch it. And so, Jonah Hill was the same thing. And he he tackled us at thing. South by Southwest and said, I love you guys. And we're like, we're gonna write a movie for you. So we, we <laughs> wrote that movie for him. We wrote what we wanted to see him do. And then when he showed up on set, it was cool to watch him do that shit. So do that with your friends and, and do that with your available materials. Like back your resources into your script. And then tell them very clearly, like guys, I'm not gonna get this right on the first weekend. I'm sorry. But I think if we do this like two or three weekends in a row, we're gonna hit something. And that kind of humility will think And help. make it really small. Make it, don't, don't try to synthesize everyone. Like take your most inspired idea re revolving around your most inspired friend and the, the, one the to one two people tops. thing and, and make that one thing really good. And I will promise you, if you make one really good thing, other people will flock to your next movie. And then they'll be like, begging you to be, and you won't be like, you know, putting them in a headlock and dragging them to the <laughs> set, you know? Good luck. And this will be our last question. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on having the last question. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try not to be the San Francisco person too, but um, you, you seem to have a lot of em empathic and empathetic qualities. And it seems to be a very challenging time to occupy a space that's that open. And like, Mark, I follow you on Twitter, but it's like, the world right now seems to be what about not. me? <laughs> <laughs> I watch you on Transparent and think you're a revelation. So, you know. Um, but I, it seems that the world right now is not really in an empathetic place. Is, is it difficult as filmmakers? Because you, you seem to occupy a sensitive, you talked about male intimacy and a sensitive special place. And I think that the current culture isn't really necessarily aligned, is yeah. that harder or, you know, like I'm saying, I don't want to make a statement, but it's formed as a question. Well, I mean, it's a really, it's a nice question, there's a lot of compliments in it, and I really appreciate all those things. Um, and um, to you. if you're getting, you know, I think, I think in general, like if you're following me, you don't need to follow Jay, you're getting most of what you need. Um, and um, I, I, here's, here's what I would say is, you know, when people ask us a question like that, which we, you know, or they ask us like, God, you really poured yourselves into this book. Was that scary for you? And I think that um, all those years of struggling to find a way to connect and not being able to get what was inside of us out to people and feeling like we had something special but we couldn't communicate it, when we found out that it was related to what you're talking about, um, to that level of empathy, that level of being able to desire to connect, intimacy, all those things, that made us excited. It made us feel like this is what we have to offer. So I think rather than shy away from it or get more difficult, it almost makes it feel like it emboldens us to a certain degree of like, well, now we maybe have a spot and we can be, you know, 
I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the only way through is empathy and, you know, take, I mean, it's, it's wild to me that, like, when we're thinking about North Korea, we're just, like, obsessed with, you know, Kim Jong-un, and we're, we're not really thinking about all the people who are oppressed there. I think that's where our energy should be is people are being oppressed and they're barely surviving. And I think if we lead with that and we lead with love, that's going to tell us where to go. And that's, um, I mean, that's, that's what's helped us through this industry. And it's the only option in, in our opinion. And yeah, we're hopeful that like the industry is taking a little bit of a shift. Um, certainly on our side of town, we're like feeling it like, and we have noticed that like, yeah, we're not making blockbuster movies. Like, our biggest worldwide grocer was $10 million, you know? Like, we're not huge, but we've carved out a little niche for ourselves, and like most of that, the reason why we continue to get greenlit and do things is like, we make good stuff, I think we generally connect, but like, we like lead with kindness and we raise people up with us, and because of that, like, I think there are more talented people than us that don't get offered for picture deals at Netflix and, and, and TV deals at HBO, but a lot of that is, is part of that, and we're, I think I'm starting to feel that there is support for that. Well, I'm, I'm really glad there is, and I really want to thank you for oh, thank uh, you. bringing your empathy Rachel here. Rosen, Rachel Rosen, everybody. Rosen. Share your book with us. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, Thanks, guys. Before we go, um, there's a lovely local bookseller out front, right? What's their name? Green Apple Books. Green Apple Books is selling books. Um, if you want to just bypass them and go buy on Amazon, I think you should. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and we, we, we just want to thank you guys for supporting this endeavor. I know, we know it costs money to come out to an event like this and your time. And you don't know if we can write a book. And you kind of took a little leap of faith on us. And it really means something. So thank you very, very much for doing that. Thanks, guys. All right, guys.